This is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army, an army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans, and through film produced by the Army Signal Corps, photographed by combat cameramen. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today, the big picture shows the United Nations forces withdraw in the face of a red offensive. You'll see the Lincoln Line established. You'll see our troops hold onto that line and later break out in an air ground assault. You'll meet an Army nurse, Captain Molly Younger of Kansas City, Missouri. You'll meet an Army medic, a man who served with the Army's 3rd Infantry Division, Sergeant Mike Proputnik of McAdoo, Pennsylvania. And now, let's go back to April 20th, 1951. During the period 20 April to 20 May, the Communists launched two phases of their expected spring offensive. On 23 April, the Reds jump off on their first phase, hitting strongest above Seoul. UN troops are forced to withdraw south as British and Belgian contingents hold off the communists in a spectacular rearguard engagement. A secondary action of this phase hits in the Huachan Reservoir area. By 30 April, UN forces cease their withdrawal and set up the Lincoln Defense Line a few miles north of Seoul. In the central sector, UN troops withdraw south of the Pukhan River, and in the east, ROK forces pull back to Yangyang. From 1 May to 16 May, there is only minor enemy activity as the communists build up for the second phase, and UN forces recover some ground north of Seoul. UN Air Forces strike at targets of opportunity. The second phase begins on 17 May with the heaviest attack in the central sector southwest of Inji and east of Chonchon. Heavy casualties are inflicted on the Reds in this area. On 20 May, the UN forces shorten their line north of Seoul, strengthen positions in the central sector, and move to plug a gap caused by the collapse of two ROK divisions. In the Imjin River area, soldiers of two combat teams quickly break camp. These combat teams are composed of British, Belgian, Filipino, and American troops. What may be the last meal for a long time is grabbed as a report is received of a large enemy force which has crossed the nearby Imjin. These UN troops start their withdrawal according to plan. Mortars blast at the approaching Reds who threaten to cut off the combat teams. The withdrawal starts south, down the main highway that passes through Weijonbu to Seoul. Hit by an enemy shell, this UN truck tractor burns. Due to machine gun and mortar fire from infiltrated enemy troops, the convoy halts. Men take cover and wait until the way has been cleared. The long convoy moves southward again with its cargo of men and equipment. 
the communist offensive was expected and nothing of use is left behind. En route, battalion commanders discuss the situation. In Wee John Bu, a sign aptly states the result of war's devastation on the town. Tanks and trucks race through the battered town to pick up units of the combat team, which are redeployed in new defense line south of Wee John Bu. Later, a battalion of infantry plods wearily through the rice paddies. After fighting off the Chinese all through the night, they slog through the pelting rain to new defensive positions. Their fatigue is apparent in every step. A little more water doesn't seem to matter much as they wade a swollen stream. Full advantage is taken of the chance for a short rest before fighting off the Reds again. Rain-soaked troops hold rear guard positions covering the withdrawal. This is the third major Red offensive of the conflict. The first was the initial North Korean aggression last June, and the second, the full-scale intervention of the Chinese Communists on 26 November. Our 155s blast evacuated Wee John Bu. Withdrawal continues as UN firepower takes a terrible toll of Chinese. Further south, nearing Seoul, the last UN vehicles cross a bridge south of Yapyong. Men of an engineer battalion pour gasoline on the bridge, which has also been mined with TNT. The bridge is destroyed. Communist human sea tactics against our superior firepower is costing them dearly for each mile they advance. This was Korea in April and May of 1951. A bit later, we'll return to the riflemen in action. But first, we want you to meet an army nurse who saw duty in Korea. She's Captain Molly Younger of Kansas City, Missouri. And Molly served with a frontline surgical team. Now, how did this team operate? What did it do? The 8076 Mobile Surgical Unit, activated in July, sent to Korea and assigned to the 24th Division. And there they were about 10 to 18 miles uh, below the clearing company. The, uh, as the first aid men picked up the casualties, gave them first aid, sent them to the clearing company, and from the clearing company were sent to our unit, the uh, Mobile Surgical Unit, for further treatment. Now, this is the first time that uh, a wounded soldier was given definitive treatment this close to the front. Is that right? That's right. It certainly must have saved a lot of lives, <coughs> Molly. Yes, it did. And uh, after the uh, treatment at our hospital, they were evac uh, evacuated by train, helicopters, and ambulances to the uh, evac hospital, which was at Pusan at that time. And from Pusan, they were sent to Japan and into the States. Now, how many months were you in Korea, Molly? Six months. Well, certainly in that time, you moved around a great deal, didn't you? How did you get around? Well, we had um, 32 vehicles assigned to the unit, and uh, most of our trips was by convoy. Well, how many of those were ambulances? Well, we had 18 ambul 14 ambulances. That's right. Well, how about the, uh, the weather in Korea? You saw a lot of different temperatures. Yes, in the beginning, it was a little hot. Of course, we didn't have time to think about the heat at that time. And uh, later on, though, it uh, was getting a little bit cold. A little well, bit too cold for some of us, but we remedied that situation, too. Mm -hmm. Well, Molly, did these extreme temperatures uh, hurt your operations any? Well, the heat wasn't, uh, didn't uh, hinder anything but the cold. Uh, due to the fact that they uh, were set up in tents in these buildings that were not heated. We did have some oil stoves that we tried to set up and work under those conditions. Mm -hmm. Well, Molly, uh, when did the surgical team see its roughest action in Korea? Well, I'd say right in the beginning, in July, August, and September. When we sustained a lot of losses, didn't we? 
Yes, and uh, there were long hours of duty for all of us. We worked from 18 to 24 hours, 36 hours, round the clock. This was the whole crew? The entire crew stayed on. And well, how many operations could you do at one time, Molly? Well, our first set up there, we had we could um, make good use of our six tables. We had six operating room tables, and uh, they were in full swing at all times. And uh, patients were taken care of as soon as they came in. And uh, we had three anestas, and some of us could hold down two or three tables at a time. That was your job. You handled That's the right. anesthesia, right? That's right. Well, Molly, certainly there are a lot out there, watching, a lot of girls watching this program who we would like to see become Army nurses. Now, this is your opportunity to talk to them, Molly. There they are. Yes, we need nurses, and very badly, especially nurses with critical MOSs, specialties. There's the uh, NP, MOS, the surgical, and most of all, anestis. Well, Molly, we're asking for nurses, asking these girls to join you in being an Army nurse. We're not doing what the Army used to do and say, uh, join and see the world. In fact, we've given them a pretty rough picture right here. But I think more important than anything else is the fact that you get a great deal of satisfaction out of your job, don't you? Yes, we do. We save lives and can't think of anything more important than to save lives. Right, Molly, we certainly can't either. Well, now, uh, you told us a few moments ago that when you received these wounded men, the only treatment they had received was from the frontline aid man, right? That's right. Well, how was that treatment? Well, it was uh, really remarkable, considering the circumstance they had uh, applied the treatment, administered the treatment. They uh, used the uh, improvised a lot of times, the uh, tourniquets and splints and use string and rope and everything else for tourniquets, in fact. But um, they all carried their uh, sulfur packs, and they, but that was the first initial treatment. Well, Molly, a little later in our program, we're going to meet one of these medical aid men. But now, let's go back to the action in Korea, April and May of 1951. At the end of the first week of the communist spring offensive, Allied units withdraw to defensive positions north of Seoul. In the western sector, where red pressure is heaviest, trucks loaded with troops move rapidly south. UN forces have broken contact with the enemy all along most of the front. As soon as defending forces have taken positions behind the Lincoln Line, final line of defense between Weijongbu and Seoul, engineers plant an extensive minefield. The anti-tank mines are armed as the field is completed. Anti-personnel mines will also be laid. To augment the minefields, barbed wire entanglements are constructed by the engineers. Working quickly, the wire is strung and stretched taut. A 75 millimeter recoilless rifle covers the valley which the Reds must cross to reach the Lincoln Line. Observers of an ROK division use this high point to advantage and keep close watch on the opposing hills. Artillery is called for to give relief to a UN tank column under enemy fire in the valley. HE shells blast the distant hills, giving support and cover to the withdrawing tanks. The armored patrol is returning to the Lincoln Line after contacting two Chinese battalions. A tank nudges a Korean hut aside to clear the field of fire for a roadblock. As Allied forces retire behind the Lincoln Line, tanks are put into use as defensive weapons. The heavy firepower of the artillery is ready. Tanks wait in emplaced positions to add their forceful punch. In the heart of Seoul, on the grounds of the Capitol building, 155 howitzers fire a sharp warning at the advancing Chinese.
the artillerymen improved their emplacements within view of the capital. Although earlier the South Korean government warned the populace to leave, almost half a million remained in the city, showing confidence in our ability to hold despite the growing menace of the Red Advance. The government was finally forced to order the evacuation. Only then did the people leave. The UN troops remained on the Lincoln Line to write the next chapter in the defense of Seoul. A field hospital in Korea. Full facilities must be available here for the first phase of treatment of the wounded. It's the critical phase. An emergency shipment of blood coming in. Whole blood, the doctor's best friend. Oft times the wounded man's only chance for life. Donated in New York or San Francisco or St. Louis, typed, stored and shipped with the strictest scientific care, it's here where it's needed. After first aid treatment and an aid station, wounded men are brought to the field hospital. Here they are given only the necessary treatment to put them in shape for speedy evacuation to a base hospital where every benefit of modern medicine and surgery is available. Almost every wounded man has lost too much blood. He needs replacement quickly to overcome or prevent shock, to make his system responsive to treatment, or capable of withstanding the shock of an operation. If a wounded man can be evacuated to a base hospital in good shape, he's as good as safe. Drop by drop, a young man's precious life is saved for his loved ones, for his country. The gifts of blood must never stop. Troops of the UN forces move along a barbed wire barricade on a ridge near the town of Tokso, part of the line of defense against the communists in this sector. As further determined to the mass assaults of the Chinese, an anti-personnel minefield is planted just beyond the UN-held line. Trip wires are adjusted from the stakes to the mines, which have an effective danger radius of 75 yards. A pressure of nine pounds against the trip wire will explode one of these lethal traps. Until the field is completely sewn, each wire is marked by a lightweight plate. On the road bordering the minefield, tanks and infantrymen of a recon company survey the defense line. The next morning, the road is strewn with the bodies of 24 members of an enemy patrol which tried to infiltrate during the night. One red soldier still lives. Men of the recon company cautiously move the wounded man onto the road from the gully. The communist is apparently in great pain, but the combat-wise soldiers, used to the tricks of a treacherous enemy, search him for concealed weapons or possible booby traps. In the shelter of one of our tanks, first aid is given to the wounded man. From a vantage point atop a hill, a machine gunner watches the valley below as his assistant adjusts his fire through a BC scope. 
An observer checks the terrain as a gunner fires at an enemy position in a village ahead. Smoke rises from the battered town. Troops of the United Nations maintain their vigilance and refuse to give up ground to the communist hordes without exacting a heavy toll for every foot of ground. A returning tank brings news that the infiltrating Reds have been routed from the village. We'd like to tell you about a very important part of our big picture, the frontline aid men. These are the men who so often are saluted by the men they serve, the riflemen, for the work they do in caring for our wounded under fire, many times while they themselves are hit. Here's Sergeant Mike Proputnik, who saw duty with the Army's 3rd Division in Korea. Mike was an aid man there. Well, let's talk about these aid men, Mike. Uh, you travel right with the rifle company, don't you? That's correct. There's four aid men and a, right, and a litter team along with the rifle company. We go and attack and uh, take care of the wounded and evacuate them as soon as possible. How about the, the terrain over there? That makes it a little rough for the evacuation, doesn't it? It does. We uh, look over the terrain before we go in and uh, find the quickest way possible 